The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right, good morning, everybody. Let's get started uh, with current topics today. Thanks for joining us. Um, thanks uh, for showing your face in the video. So I'm not talking to a black wall. That's very nice. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, HCI design patterns, um, which is um, an interesting format to express what you know about uh, the HCI design in a particular domain. As always, uh, information about this on our jump page. Um, and this is going to be interactive because I'm going to ask you right now uh, to start thinking and pitching in your thoughts. So the very first in-class exercise to motivate why we're looking at design patterns in HCI um, is the following question. Um, imagine yourself, which is not very unlikely, to be a software developer um, and you're working on a new software project. Now, um, if you're in a company or, you know, even if you just you know, started a startup or something, uh, there will be other disciplines that you um, will probably want to involve. And I would like to hear from you what kind of um, disciplines, what other stakeholders, what other professions you think will be part of your project. Um, I will start a little whiteboard here um, and just try to capture what you guys are, are putting up. So uh, just unmute your mic and, uh, and make some suggestions so I can start scribbling. Users. Users, yeah, we definitely have users, clearly. Developers. Developers, clearly. So that would be available. Testers. Say again. Uh, software testers. Testers, yep. Mm -hmm. Designer. Mm -hmm. Designers, okay. Uh, now, designer is a very broad term. Uh, can you say what you mean by the designer? Uh, UI UX experts. What for okay. me, for people that design the UI and uh, the UX. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, UI UX designers. Okay. Um, even that is still a broad term because, but, but we're going to get into details later. Um, could be people who do the visuals. It could be people who make the information architecture, uh, the navigation logic or something like this or uh, but that's that's a good good broad term. Um, who else? Project manager. Mm -hmm. That's gonna gonna be project managers for sure. If it's an agile project, you have uh, roles like Scrum master and product owner. Mm -hmm. So that, would they be developers or well, they're more, are they more project managers? Kind of in between, right? Yeah, m maybe specialized project managers, kind of. Mm -hmm. And project owner or product owner, I think is the term, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, the mar marketing department. Ah, yes. I mean, I, I love you guys for not thinking about money. This is the right approach at the university. You should not be thinking about just making money. Uh, but yeah, in the real world, you will be and, uh, you know talking to people from the marketing department because they want to sell your awesome software and make some money. Anybody else? Well, I would wager, um, are you going to just release it open source or are you going to worry about um, protecting your software? Are you going to be dealing with anything like that? Legal lawyers or something? Or yeah, that other thing that we don't like to think about, right? Yeah, so legal. You'll probably be talking to legal. There will be people who 
who manage that part of your project. Anyway, so this is a broad area and I, I tried to divide this up into sort of rough columns where you can see on the, towards the right hand side, we've got people that are more concerned about the um, internal workings of the software, how to build the code, who have the technical expertise to make the project work. Um, and towards the left, we have the people who are concerned about the application area. So you could probably say that your testers uh, would also go over, over here. Um, your marketing department is also probably going to be, you know, more interested in the user oriented view of things. Um, and in the middle, you've got, you know, people like the UI UX designers, maybe people like yourself who are developers, but have a, um, have a background in HCI. Um, who need to somehow uh, link all these things together. Now, there's going to be a lot of, you know, uh, connections here in all kinds of different ways where people need to talk to each other. But one major axis that you will see will be going sort of from here, from left to right. Um, and with which I mean that it's, it's sort of a connection between the uh, user-centric view of things and the uh, technology-centric one. And your role, in, in a way, is to uh, to link those together. So let's uh, let's see if we can get back to the slides here real quick. Hold on. So um, one big axis of communication that you will be that you'll be seeing um, is sort of this axis of the user point of view and the software uh, point of view, and you're kind of sitting in the middle. Um, now the users or, or you know is not just a homogeneous mass right there will be people who are your actual end users who are going to be using your system there may be people who have um expertise in the domain they might be for example if you're developing something for um uh you know for for cars for uh, you know where the ultimate user is going to be the driver you're going to have people who are experts in um you know in driver behavior maybe psychologists maybe or people who know the application domain really well, even though they're not your end user, teachers of whatever uh, people are doing that, that use your software. Um, and um, in the middle, we have sort of you, right? And the, the title I gave us there, or you there, is uh, Master Architect of Custom Experience, which sounds like a really nice thing to put on your business card one day, right? Master Architect of Custom Experience. Um, the key role here is to, to link people together who come from different disciplines uh, and who speak wildly different languages. And I'm sure you have encountered this yourself. Um, if you try to sort of explain what you're doing to somebody from a completely different field, let's say to, like, you know, to, to a biologist or to, to somebody who's studying physics or whatever, um, there's gonna be a mismatch in like what you think, uh, you know, how you work, for example. Um, each of these different fields have different, um, have different languages to start with. So they're basically speaking different language. They have used different terms for the concepts that they, that they talk about. Um, and they also, by, by uh, consequence of having different languages, that also means that they have different values in the end. Um, what I mean by this, for example, is that um, if you take um, a typical software developer, um, he will love to uh, build code that runs without crashing, right? You know, so you know, flawless execution of the code is, is really important. Um, if you talk to a, um, a visual designer, for example, uh, they might be very concerned in the, the beauty, the aesthetic um, of a drawing. And when you put these two things together uh, in building an interactive software product, you've got you know, the visual artistic view, you've got the uh, very technical view, um, it gets very hard to talk to each other. Um, there is a wonderful um, little uh, story by Rich Gold, who was uh, um, the head of uh, the, the interdisciplinary sort of art slash um, design slash research uh, unit read at uh, Xerox Park for many years. Um, and he wrote a book called The Plenitude. Um, and in this, he, he says that um, he, you know, he ended up wearing four different hats, you know, the hat of the uh, scientist who values what is true, um, you know, finding truth. This is what we often do when we do you know, scientific validation, for example, the stuff we talked about last week um, in this class. 
um, you've got the engineer who's interested in running code efficiently, for example, building something that is efficient, which is what you learn in many of the, the other classes in the computer science curriculum. Um, you've got you know, um, the artist who's interested in the beauty of, of a work, uh, and you've got the, the designer who's often interested in sort of the cool, the elegant of, 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 of a design. And these are four different value systems in the end, um, and these people have a really hard time talking to each other. Now, you might say, what's the big deal? Well, if they can't talk to each other, what's the problem? The problem is that if you don't speak the other discipline's language, uh, you actually cannot understand their reasoning, and ultimately it's going to be hard for you to respect what they do. And we often see that, right? You know, engineers like to uh, joke about, you know, people who, who are just doing math without any real applications or who are doing just, you know, uh, art without um, any, any, you know, usable product in the end. Um, and this, this, this gap that develops there between these different positions um, is a huge problem in, in projects. You will encounter this the moment that you enter a, a, a real product um, you know, making company where you have all these different roles that we just talked about. That's why I made you think of this, this list. So it's a question of different disciplines. How do we make them talk to each other better? And that's a crucial aspect of building a successful interactive software product that you have these two disciplines inform each other and, and help each other. And this is where design patterns come in. That's why I introduced this, this problem of interdisciplinary design that is so hard to talk to each other and, and take each other seriously. Design patterns are trying to be a common language for this particular situation that I've just described. So that end users, designers, developers can all talk about the same thing using a common language of terms and words and uh, in the end design values that everybody can understand and therefore also share or disagree, you know, if they don't, if they don't think that's the right, um, that's the right approach. So what's a design pattern? Note that right now I'm not talking about design patterns in HCI and we won't be talking about design patterns in HCI for a little while. Uh, we'll only get to HCI towards the end of today's class and then we'll do the HCI coverage in breadth uh, uh, two weeks from now because there's no class next week. Um, but here I'm talking about design patterns in a very general term. Um, in a very general sense, a design pattern describes a solution. So it solves a problem, but not just any problem, not just a problem that you just came about once or twice in your life, but actually a, a problem that is recurring, that comes up many times. Um, it's also not just any problem. It's not, you know, what's like three plus four, uh, but it's a design problem. So it's a problem that's hard, that's messy, right? That you cannot just put a clear cut solution out that will always solve it. Um, and then there is this little word contextualized, which means it's not a design problem that is abstract without any real world situation bearing on it, uh, but it's a design problem that is situated in the real world that you face with a real software product that actual people are supposed to use in their actual workplace, for example. Then we say here that it's a successful solution. So uh, hopefully you're describing a solution that actually works. Um, there are people who describe anti-design patterns uh, that are solutions that don't work to, to let other people know uh, what not to do. And that's great, although I believe more in the uh, positive example setting of design patterns and, and instruction in general, rather than telling people what not to do. You know, it's like, you know, don't think about a pink elephant. Um, still means that everybody will think about a pink elephant. So um, that's a design pattern. And there's more to it. Uh, design patterns are not just, you know, a solution, but it's the solution uh, together with other solutions um, connected into what's called a, a pattern language. So usually you could have just, you know, 10 golden rules, for example, the 10 golden rules are not the design patterns because they're not networked. They don't reference each other into a consistent language. They're all also not all expressed in the exact same format. Um, a design pattern will always be part of a, a larger language. So it's written in a consistent format. And finally, design patterns, and this is where it gets interesting because some of the design patterns that you know are probably not design patterns in the sense, design patterns should be readable by non-experts, people who are not from the original field that the design pattern 
uh, is about. I'm going to get into more details about this in just a, a minute and explain what I mean by uh, readable by non-experts. Here's a really old example of a design pattern. It's, it's really old. It's like 500 years old. Um, this is from Trattato Uno uh, by Francesco Di Giorgio, um, who was um, a master builder in the Renaissance, you know, in the um, outgoing uh, 15th century. Um, architecture was flourishing during that time. And what master builders did was they, they started to structure what had been learned in architecture about how to build successful machines, um, you know, farming machines, for example, these are irrigation machines that you're seeing here to pull water out of a, um, um, a pond. Um, and uh, these master builders were not architects in the modern sense that have a clearly defined small part where they only look at sort of the design of a building and conceptualization, but they, they leave the actual building and engineering question to somebody else. But master builders were sort of a proto-architect and they, they understood both sides of the coin. So they were almost like, if you wanted to transport this into modern times, they were the interface designers that ex designed the user experience of these machines or, or, or houses or buildings, but they also actually were, knew how to build them. So they were also sort of the, the developers of these things. And um, this, this guy from Siena here, Francesco Giorgio, was, uh, became very prominent because he started collecting these things in a, in a format that was always of the same sort. He had certain kinds of drawings that went with each machine. Um, they were proven solutions that had shown their value in, the, in, in reality. They were solving recurring problems because getting water up a hill, for example, was a problem. It, it continued to be um, in, in agriculture. And they had this sort of consistent format to them. So you could say this is probably the earliest example of uh, somebody connecting, uh, collecting design patterns. Um, and it wasn't just containing the information of how to build it, it also contained the information of how to use it. So let me become very sort of, um, you know, liberal artsy for a minute. Uh, if you want to, if you want to describe what a design pattern is, it's not so much a technical thing, it is actually probably best described as a new literary form. Now what, I'm, what, what is a literary form? A literary form is essentially um, a way of writing uh, a document of some sort where the author and the reader know how it's going to be structured even before they see it. If I tell you there's a newspaper article about uh, Trump, you don't know what it's going to say. Well, maybe you know what it's going to say, but technically you don't know what it's going to say, but you know how it's going to be uh, structured. You know it's going to have a headline, it's probably going to have a subheading, and then it's going to report about something, you know, some current affair. If I tell you there's an encyclopedia article about Trump, um, that will mean that you expect some kind of other format, right? If I tell you there's a letter from Trump, you expect yet another form of, of how it's written. Uh, if it's a novel about him or a poem, God forbid, um, you know, this, you're always having different expectations about the form, right, that this, this will take, and you know what to expect. And essentially, a pattern is just that. It's a certain way of structuring your writing. Um, you could say a research paper that we just went over the last couple of weeks is another example, right? We know kind of what to expect where, and we need to learn this literary form to be able to read and write it. And a pattern is just the same thing. It's a certain way of writing down stuff in a certain structure uh, that authors and readers uh, agree upon. So patterns are really, um, if you want, a new literary form or a, you know, a medium of communication between uh, people who want to say something about a certain design that they think is, is successful and those who want to learn about it. Note that patterns in this sense are about human-human communication. They're not necessarily about informing the computer what to do. Uh, that will become important later when we talk about software design patterns. Now, when, why am I going on about uh, design patterns outside of HCI? Uh, because design patterns did not originate in, or in HCI. They did not originate in computer science or programming, although that's what many of you probably think. Uh, design patterns actually originated, you could say, in the 1500s or in the 1400s, uh, with this guy who wrote Tratato Uno, 
Um, but the modern term of uh, a pattern language and a design pattern actually started in the 70s. Um, Christopher Alexander um, is an architect um, who back in the, in the 70s um, wanted to capture something. Um, so uh, what he was trying to do, he understood that people um, had trouble in, in, in housing projects when a new uh, neighborhood was being built in a city. The inhabitants there had trouble expressing what they really wanted for the neighborhood. Um, they noticed, in fact, he noticed, in fact, uh, that people were kind of forgetting about how to design, you know, human, enjoyable um, dwellings, houses, neighborhoods, cities, streets, and so on. And so he was, col he collected with, with his team of uh, collaborators, a whole bunch of patterns of successful human urban architecture. This thing contained over 250 patterns, each of which describes one aspect of how a building, a street, a neighborhood, a room, uh, a garden uh, is designed in an urban context to make it enjoyable to live in and to make it work for a human community. Um, this helped, this was the inspiration for software design designers, software engineers to do what they call pattern languages. But we'll get to that inspiration aspect in, in just a few minutes. First of all, uh, Alexander didn't just write these 250 patterns, he also wrote what you could probably call the, the user guide to these patterns, which is the, the second book, uh, The Timeless Way of Building, which describes his design process that he suggests to use if you follow his patterns. So it's kind of the companion volume. The first one um, had the patterns, the second one sort of has the process. And we're gonna, for a minute, we're gonna focus on this second aspect now, talk about the patterns more than the, uh, the, the process more than the actual patterns. So um, one key insight that Alexander made, and when we talk about this, we're gonna talk about architecture here for a moment, but in your, in your head, try to apply what we hear, try to see parallels to HCI, right? To what we do when we design an interface. And we'll make that link in just a few minutes. Um, the fundamental observation that, pattern, that Alexander made was that um, if you have something going on a lot in a, um, sorry, I need to uh, power up my computer here real quick. Right, okay, so. Um, the, uh, the key thing here that um, Alexander was observing is that if you have a, a building or a town um, and things are happening in there frequently, regularly, again and again, uh, then what will happen is that the town or the, the, the streets, the neighborhoods, etc., will ultimately shape in the way that uh, people use them. So the events that keep happening, um, will shape the character. Uh, uh, to make his point, he put a sort of typical uh, New York, Manhattan uh, sidewalk, or uh, I think this is Tokyo actually, sorry, Tokyo sidewalk um, next to a, a, a typical Mumbai sidewalk. Um, on the, the one is basically mostly used for walking, really just to get from A to B. Uh, the other one is also used for getting from A to B, but it's also used for parking, for cooking, for eating, for sleeping. Um, and that will just shape the way that these environments look. So this is the fundamental observation that, that Alexander um, made. Uh, and he said there are patterns of events that you know, events keep reoccurring. And there will be patterns in space that get shaped by these events that keep happening there. Um, but it works the other way around too. Right? So um, if you have uh, the pattern on the left-hand side, the space pattern of the wide you know, empty sidewalk, then it will uh, you know, not invite some of the activities that the kind of sidewalk will invite that you see on the right-hand side. So patterns of space will also shape patterns of events. Um, but Alexander, it was important to him to, to not just talk about this without any, any values or preferences expressed. He said that there is actually um, a certain quality in, in particular environments that make them um, uh, 
enjoyable. They, they support certain patterns of events that we want to see um, through their design. Um, and he said that this quality that a space has, he, he could really couldn't put a name on it pre precisely. Um, maybe we would call it, you know, user friendly today or something, but he called it the quality without a name, you know, QWAN uh, or Quan, as he liked to say, very uh, uh, um, metaphysical. Um, the second point that he uh, kept seeing in observing patterns that people had shaped was that if you give it, give it time uh, and the freedom to, to design, then actually inhabitants are really good at creating the right environments. You know, he was looking at, for example, um, farmhouses and he said the way that a farm is laid out uh, is decided by the farmer who lives and works there. And over generations, um, these farmers really have understood how best to lay out their farm, uh, how, how to build a good farm so that it supports the activities that need to happen there in an optimal way. They didn't need a, a farmer architect to come in and design it for them. They understood um, how this design should work. But today, environments aren't designed by um, uh, their users anymore, right? So um, if you just think about this uh, for, for a minute, uh, if you look around yourself, the space that you live in, um, most of you probably didn't design this themselves or even build it themselves. Well, maybe if you just built a house yourself, um, then you, you could say, well, at least I had a word in what it looks like, but most of us you know, move into buildings that were designed and built by somebody else. Um, and so that means that these environments uh, have a hard time of supporting the patterns that, uh, uh, that their inhabitants would like to carry out in there in an ideal way. Um, for example, the university buildings that you go to or, you know, any other public spaces that you use and even including your, your own rental apartment um, are when you were not designed with just your ideal preferences in mind. What that means is that in a way, um, inhabitants have sort of forgotten what uh, the best design patterns are to, uh, to create their spaces because they're not responsible for it anymore. Um, and the patterns that Alexander wrote were trying to capture exactly this. They were trying to capture how, what the best practices are in designing hum, humane, human-friendly, uh, inhabitable urban environments. And why did he do this? He didn't do this just for his fellow architects. In fact, his fellow architects were not really the primary address, you know, uh, you know target group for this. Uh, in fact, he was actually... Um, annoying a lot of his architecture colleagues a lot because what he was proposing essentially was what we know in HCI to be a great process for for many years and that's participatory design. You may remember from DIS1 participatory design means that you don't just occasionally go to your user and test your system with but you make the user an active part of the design process throughout all stages. So our Alexander's design patterns were written so that amateurs, people who lived in a neighborhood that was supposed, was about to be rebuilt by a town city project, um, could read up and, and identify with, or, or maybe reject or agree with these patterns that he proposed, but so that they had a, a vocabulary of expressing their interest in how their environments should work and look for them. And so this is the first link I'm seeing here to, to HCI, right? This is essentially user-centered design, uh, participatory design even, getting the user into an even more active role um, for physical environments, houses, streets, neighborhoods. Guess who today, if you check on Amazon, who is the best audience for Alexander's books? It's not architects, because architects hated that idea. Um, most architects said, I don't want these, you know, future inhabitants to tell me how to build the environment. I'm going to do my grand architectural design that's going to look really good on the blueprint and it's going to look really great if you fly over it with a drone. Um, you know, but it may not be so enjoyable to work in, and live in. I mean, you've probably walked the halls of the Kaman Auditorium before it was closed down. Um, not exactly a super enjoyable place to be in, uh, but probably received an architectural award for its design at the time. So a lot of architects were not that into getting too much power into the hands of their customers, essentially. 
They said, I'm the architect. I know how to design a building and it's going to look great. Um, and I don't want, you know, these pesky amateurs to, to mess with my design. So the best audience actually turned out to be amateur remodelers, people who were remodeling their own backyard, who were rebuilding their own home. They read Archite uh, Alexander's book. They understood it because it was written for non-experts and they could actually use and apply the, 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 the wisdom captured in these patterns, the design expertise captured in these patterns to their own designs. Let's get a little more concrete with some examples. Um, here's the front porch. What is, and the front porch, Alexander said, is, is an enjoyable thing to have. It supports good patterns of events. It supports people hanging out in their own front yard, um, you know, observing what's going on in the street in the neighborhood, but being close to, you know, their, their drinks and stuff. Uh, and so it's something nice to have. But what's, what makes it a pattern? He said, it's not exactly which color the columns are. It's not exactly whether the, you know, the, the, the staircase there is made from wood or concrete. It's not exactly where the door is that leads inside. Um, what is essential is that it is raised above street level so that you can look out on the street. You're a bit, bit higher than that. Um, it's deep enough for a group of people to sit comfortably. So you can sit and you know, pass each other and, and, and hang out in a lounge chair. Um, and it is open at the front towards the street, uh, but has a roof supported by columns um, so that you could look out on the street, but you would have some protection from the elements if you, if you needed that, um, or at least from the sun if it wasn't going to rain in your, in your area where you live. Um, and that were the key things. So there were some aspects of this design um, that were important. So the essentials of a porch, he said, is how it relates to the environment, the street, for example, and, and the house behind it, and what kinds of events, what kinds of activities it supports. The other thing that I said earlier on about design patterns is that they don't stand alone. Right? They are linked in a language. They're linked together um, in what you would call a directed acyclic graph. Right? Um, it's not a tree, uh, it's more complex than that, but it is a directed sort of hierarchical arrangement like a class hierarchy, if you want. Um, so why is it a hierarchy? Why are patterns linked to each other? Because in Alexander's sense, every pattern needs two things. First of all, um, for its details, how it's gonna be fleshed out further once you adopt the idea, for example, of a front porch, you need to understand uh, how to make it work. So you need more implementation details if you want. So once you understand how to make a front porch, maybe you need a pattern about, you know, a good way of building um, uh, uh, a, a staircase, building leading up to it, and you need to understand how to maybe uh, where to place the front porch. And then the other thing um, that uh, patterns needed in Alexander's sense is the design context. Remember, we said earlier that design patterns are a contextualized solution. So a contextualized design problem. Um, Context in this case in architecture means simply where am I going yeah. to place this? Where is it going to be situated? Yes. Um, for all of us, like what the sound, for all of the sound is cracking. I'm going to continue from here. That was a nice, interesting recovery. All right. Um, good. So what we have here is this connection of patterns A uh, with the context that they come from. So what are the other patterns that I need to apply before I use this current one? And then the references, you know, which more detailed patterns do I need to know about after I want, I've decided to apply this current pattern to get into, um, you know, the implementation of it. So um, in a way, patterns actually um, balance forces. Uh, what I mean by this is that um, patterns often solve a problem by um, finding a balance point between conflicting forces. And these forces um, can be all kinds of things. They can be natural forces, you know, re really like the, 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 the forces of physics or something like this. Um, but they often can also be forces in architectural design, at least, um, of um, the physical environment. So, for example, you only have that much space in a, in a, in a building lot, so you cannot create uh, a huge front uh, yard. 
uh, because the space isn't there. Or it could be economic. You don't have enough money to do this wonderful front porch that you were building or wanting to build. But on the other hand, um, you know, there's a psychological interest to have uh, the front porch for the well-being of people. Or, you know, the, the effects could be social. Maybe there's something that works really well to increase the uh, well-being of one person, but not so much the well-being of the community around it. Um, here's an example. The picture on the right shows it nicely. Um, if you were to enter this apartment uh, at a friend's house, uh, where would you likely go and sit down if nobody was there yet and you were basically just, you know, picking a place? A lot of people would like to go, you know, people like to go towards the light. They like to go towards the um, the window. Maybe computer scientists are a little more different, um, but in general, you know, people tend to be drawn towards the light. Uh, but they also like to sit down. And if there was no seat at the window there, uh, this little bench, then you would either stand at the window or you would have to sit down uh, at the chairs, which are not so close into this like nice little built out window there. So um, Alexander has a pattern in his collection called Window Place. Uh, which actually um, resolves that by saying, you know, make sure that you have a seating opportunity inside these uh, uh, window alcoves, these, these you know, alka you would call it in, in German. I just want to double check. Um, uh, I, Anka, are you guys hearing and seeing everything all right? Yeah, I think nobody's complaining, at least in the chat or something. Yeah, okay, good, all right. So, Let's go over an actual pattern from Alexander's collection. This pattern is called sitting wall. Um, and I'm gonna go over the various parts here. We don't need to read every single sentence here, but I want you to understand what the structure is like. Each pattern in Alexander's connection, uh, collection starts with a name uh, and a ranking. The name gives the pattern a, uh, a short name to refer to and this helps people build up a vocabulary of solutions. It's like a little design uh, guidebook that tells you, oh, now I can use sitting wall as a pattern in my design. I can apply it to my design as a little part. Um, the ranking just expresses the author's um, preference of these patterns. You know, like a three-star pattern, in, in, for example, in Alexander's rankings, will mean that he always believes that this pattern needs to be put in place in a solu successful solution in this context. There are no alternatives. Whereas, you know, like a one star or zero pattern, a zero star pattern means that uh, he's pretty sure that there are alternative ways to solve the problem, or maybe he even has several patterns that serve as alternatives. Um, his patterns are also numbered uh, so that you have a sequence, um, and the sequence starts with very big patterns, you know, about towns and neighborhoods, all the way down to very small scale patterns uh, that address only, for example, um, the, like the, um, the window seat, how to lay out a single room. So Alexander has a nice um, a benefit here. He could use just geometrical size to determine how to order his patterns, right? The biggest patterns about towns came at the beginning, and then he basically shrinks them down and goes smaller and smaller um, until you end up designing, you know, the, the individual room. Next up, we have uh, a sensitizer. In Alexander's case, the sensitizer is an image. It's there to draw you into the pattern and to give you an at-a-glance idea of what the pattern is about. Now, this is a pretty crummy picture that Alexander put in there, but what it shows is a couple people sitting on a very low wall, um, and you know, kids are sitting there playing and there's somebody on the other side sitting on another similar wall under a tree um, reading or something. Uh, so that gives you an idea of what this is about. We, we see like a, a garden area, we see a, a footpath. So this gives you an idea of what the sitting wall pattern is about. It's the wall that people are sitting on, obviously. Next comes the context. This is the ingoing um, arrows, if you like, in our graph into a node. If the node is sitting wall, you know, each pattern is a node in our graph, then the ingoing edges, the arrows, are the context. They link to higher level patterns that you should look at before um, to determine whether this pattern is the right one to look at. And if you look at this text here, uh, he says, you know, he assumes that you, you, that you do sort of a top-down design. You've decided at some point that you have created a, an outdoor space arrange, uh, a layout, 
and he refers to a couple of patterns there. Uh, outdoor spaces, green streets, pedestrian streets, half-hidden gardens, hierarchy of open spaces, path shape, activity pockets, private terraces on the street, outdoor rooms, openings to the street, galleries, surround, garden growing wild. Um, you know, these are all um, patterns. We don't know exactly what they do, but the names already suggest something to us. Right? They seem to be building blocks of laying out a neighborhood. Um, and uh, once you've looked at all these, he also refers to seat spots and front door benches. Um, and now comes this sitting wall pattern, right? This, this gives you context for the moment in your design when you should be looking at this pattern and asking yourself, does this pattern make sense for me? Next comes the problem statement. The problem statement is always printed in bold font in Alexander's patterns. Um, and it comes, uh, in this case, it says in many places, Walls and fences between outdoor spaces are too high, but no boundary at all does injustice to the subtlety of the divisions between the spaces. So put simply, he's saying, if you don't put a fence at all, people are just gonna walk over it and, and stray dogs are gonna walk in. In fact, he refers to that um, in his text below. But if you put a, you know, like a two meter high uh, concrete wall, it's gonna be very forbidding and it's not gonna be um, it's going not really nice to walk by, right? Or, or to live inside, actually both are not enjoyable. So in this case, the, the, the um, forces are laid out really well, right? The force is literally one pulling the wall up, which is you need some boundary, and the other one pushing the wall down, which says don't make it too high so that you know, people can't even see across it. After that, this is then this, the pages three and four of the, the pattern here continued, comes several examples where he says, where in which cultures, in which uh, environments, in which uh, towns, he has seen solutions to this problem. Um, and um, he sometimes even cites other people, right? In this case, um, he mentions another um, uh, author, Ruskin, who describes a sitting wall that he experienced. Um, and then he derives from that a solution. And it always is printed in boldface in Alexander's collection uh, and has the word therefore in front of it. And this is the sort of one, two sentence summary of what you should do. He says, surround any natural outdoor area and make minor boundaries between outer areas with low walls, about 16 inches high and wide enough to sit on at least 12 inches wide. So very concrete here, even giving you measurements for this particular part of his design. Next comes a diagram that is kind of a, a, an, a simplification of the picture we saw in the beginning. The picture in the beginning was realistic to draw you in and be very relatable, but here he has pulled out the essence of his design in a graphical sketch. And the last part of every pattern is the references. This is the outgoing edges pointing to further patterns down the graph that are about more details that you need to look at once you have decided you want to apply this pattern. So he refers here to soft tile and brick. He again refers to seat spots uh, and he also mentions ornament and raised flowers. So you can see these are things about the details of, of, uh, of how to do the sitting wall. Or sometimes there are also alternatives, right? Seat spots um, also came up in the context. So while Alexander is applying, this is important to understand, he's applying a very mathematical model here for an architect saying he's gonna arrange his patterns in a, in a directed acyclic graph. But he's not a computer scientist. He doesn't care if there's occasionally a cycle in it, but right? if he sometimes points up to a pattern, that doesn't break his model. Um, so you know, sometimes you will find these things um, not being perfect directed acyclic graphs in, in, in his language. And that's fine. What you've glanced from this, I hope, is that by just looking at this pattern for three minutes or so, you have understood a crucial part about outdoor design of you know, gardens and, and front lawns. And that's the idea of patterns, quickly getting across some expertise that the professional designer has that he wants to pass on to uh, a larger community. That's exactly what these patterns are for. Now, 
if you design with these patterns, uh, that will mean that you apply a certain design philosophy as well, a certain design process. And it's a very well-known one because, again, it's very related to how we do computer science and how we do software projects. It's essentially an unfolding top-down design. You start with the big questions. Where am I going to put this house? Um, and how am I going to divide it up into rooms? And then you get down to, okay, where exactly are the doors, the windows going to be in each room, etc. So the design starts with large questions and in, in, in architectural case, it shrinks down to smaller and smaller areas that you concern yourself with. So the design sort of unfolds, it gets filled with more and more details. The blueprint is at first just a rough sketch and then you put in more and more fine details as you go. But Alexander isn't a fool. He's not believing that all design in the world happens by architects who start with a clean slate and then can do this process once and then have a perfect solution. He knows that that's not reality. What's actually happening around us all the time is that design iterates, it gets redesigned. Most buildings that you live in have been redesigned once or several times over the course of their life. Your neighborhoods keep getting redesigned. Cities are in a constant flux, right? So he says, actually, some, some of the qualities that he refers to, these qualities without a name, will only emerge after many people have applied all these various patterns whenever they have a chance to design or redesign some aspect of their built environment. The neighborhood, the city, you know, put another uh, pedestrian walkway in, you know, close another uh, big street, etc. So he says, over time, um, over this, uh, of piecemeal growth, growth, you know, piece by piece, um, these qualities can emerge. And again, that's also often the case with software projects, large software products that live on over, you know, decades, um, keep getting tinkered with. All right, enough of architecture. Um, let's look at how the software community picked up all this stuff. Um, in 1987, something really interesting happened. Um, Kent Beck, who was at Apple at the time, so again, we're coming across Apple, I don't know, it happens a lot, uh, and Ward Cunningham from, of the company Tektronix, who used to make monitors uh, and, and, and terminals, uh, met at the Uppsala conference. The Uppsala conference is about object-oriented programming systems, languages, and applications. So this is a hardcore nerd developer conference, right? Academic slash practitioner software development. And they realized something. Um, Object-oriented programming had been on the rise for, for quite some time at this point. You might remember when we talked about, uh, if, if you're attending GIS2, you know that you know, the object-oriented concept for window uh, uh, systems you know, kind of emerged in the early 80s with the um, Alto and Star. And um, wasn't still wasn't picked up yet for for um, actual industry use yet because computers were too slow, at least the ones you could use in, in a business. Um, so they realized that uh, if you do object-oriented programming, the entity relationship diagram and modeling process that had been established by databases and it wasn't cutting it anymore. Um, so they realized uh, that they had something um, that they could use instead and they had read Alexander and they liked his idea um, that sounded to them like end user programming. It sounded to them like he's involving the users in the design uh, process and the development process. And of course, that's what he's doing for architecture. So they ran a little uh, experiment. Um, and in this experiment, they gave some patterns to uh, normal users. They were patterns about how to design uh, small talk applications. Again, it's small talk, right? Uh, the grandfather of object oriented programming. And these patterns described how you would design a simple window-based app in Smalltalk. Not the detailed coding, but the questions of what classes would you need, what kind of user interface con uh, parts would you put in front of the user in the application, this kind of stuff. Um, and they found that these end users were actually able to come up with fairly reasonable rough design sketches for the apps that they would want to use. Because they were 
experts in the application domain in biology, for example. So they were really good at laying out what a little biology helping tool would need to look like for them. Not surprising for us from an HCI point of view, but very surprising for these guys um, who were in the, in, the, in the software development community. So they gave these uh, window design patterns, um, like, you know, uh, collect low level protocol. I don't want to go into much detail about what these patterns look like. They're, they're no longer um, you know, current design patterns these days, but um, they gave them to them, explained them to them briefly, and then gave them a little task and found that these non-programmers, these, these biologists uh, and, and other uh, domain experts were able to come up with reasonable GUI designs for their applications. And this got people crazy. It started the whole software design patterns idea. Uh, I think Kent Beck was heard saying at that time that, um, you know, once this happened, we started talking back patterns until we were blue in the face. Then a few years later, um, this idea of patterns had caught on enough that four folks set out and wrote a book called Design Patterns. Um, and I'm not sure, um, maybe you can do this um, because I cannot actually currently see you guys with the, uh, with the Zoom interface here on my, on my iPad. So uh, maybe you guys, uh, um, Anke, you can run a quick, just a show of hands, um, who has heard of this book, Design Patterns, by Eric Gamma, Richard Helm, Ralph Johnson, and John Blissidus. You can just do a blue, blue hand raising or something like this just to see um, who else has, has heard of that. And then you'll have to have to tell me because I'm right now I'm not seeing you guys. I have six hands up. No, All right, it's okay. five. It's five hands. All right, okay. So this book is also referred to as the Gang of Four book, um, and um, what it what it uh, what it was trying to do was basically capturing design patterns of object oriented software development um, in in a, in a collection. It had overall, it was consisting of 23 patterns. Each of them was quite elaborate, a little chapter really. Um, and they were all about software engineering, um, how to build code, how to write code. Uh, they structured them into three different kinds. Some were uh, for the uh, creation of objects and classes. Some were of the, for the structural connection between classes and objects. Um, and some were for the behavior of objects in their, uh, at runtime in their interaction with other uh, classes and objects. The book was a huge success. Um, in fact, some of you have heard about these patterns, um, like Singleton, for example, or Abstract Factory, or Adapter, or Facade. These patterns are actually pretty well known these days um, in, the, in the community. I'm going to try to connect to the, okay, I've, I've now connected to the, 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 oh yeah, that should, that should help me. I should be able to see the participants at least. Okay, I've got a list of participants up again at least. Um, so the pattern was, um, the, the pattern on this are, have, have been very successful. You probably know some of these yourself and you use them in your own object-oriented designs. Um, each of these patterns is about 10 book pages of text. Um, and uh, here's an example. Uh, I, I'll first give you the quick notation cheat sheet. I think we can go over this quickly because this is a standard notation that you guys know. Um, abstract name, uh, abstract classes or concrete classes are written in, in bold font with a class name and then they have operations and instance variables underneath, uh, links to pseudocode for implementation. Um, then uh, there is an aggregate uh, connection between a, uh, between a partial class and an abstract class. There is a fabrication, there's a connection between a factory class to a concrete class with this dotted line. Uh, the, the standard inheritance and reference um, connection uh, relationships are there. Uh, and objects can reference each other via object references, which you can see there at the, at the bottom right. And the, the bottom left shows the, the um, uh, viewing at runtime of one object being, uh, that has been instantiated and that then instantiates a second object, object two on the right hand side. Um, and that then calls some method on it, some operation on it. Um, so uh, these are all notations that I think you guys are, are quite familiar with. So let's look at an example from Gamma's book, right? The, the book of the Gang of Four. 
um, this pattern that I'm describing to you here is called um, abstract factory. And if you know it, then bear with us for a minute. I want to explain it to everybody. Um, the explanation of the abstract, abstract factory pattern starts with an example in the Gang of Four book. And the example that the Gang of Four book uses is called widget factory. Funnily enough, it's another GUI pattern. It's actually a pattern of how to build graphical user interface architectures. So what does widget factory, the example, describe? It describes the following problem. You are a developer of an application. You want to develop your application for two different interface technologies. You know, today you would say for Mac OS and for Windows. Um, back then they said you might want to develop it for Motif, you know, the um, Motif widget set um, of, of uh, Unix at the time and X Windows, um, or you might want to develop it for Presentation Manager, which was the um, user interface toolkit for uh, OS2 back in the time by IBM. How do you do that? Well, you could write your complete code twice with two different, you know, with two different UI toolkits, but that's kind of ugly. So instead what you do is you introduce a pattern that is called widget factory. And the widget factory is a class that has abstract functions like create a scroll bar. And then in your code, in one line, you say whether you want this code to be a motif uh, a widget based code or a presentation manager widget based code. And these subclasses of widget factory are basically then creating concrete widgets, for example, um, from the uh, motif user interface toolkit or from the presentation manager interface toolkit. So what that means is that you're not actually putting the concrete classes of the window in there, but uh, these factories create the windows for you. So a client app that you are writing that uses the widget factory doesn't have to invoke anything like um, create pre uh, presentation manager window. It just invokes create window. And through some setting in the app, that means that the widget factory will return a concrete um, window from, for example, presentation manager, if that's the current setting that you want. And that current, that presentation manager window, then you also don't never talk to directly as a client. You only talk to the window that your widget factory basically returns to you. Um, so you basically are, your client is always only t creating and talking to abstract versions of uh, widgets that are not specific to a particular UI toolkit. And the uh, concrete UI toolkit widgets are being created behind the scenes and talked to behind the scenes. You don't need to worry about this, which makes your code really nice because you have very little that you need to change, um, uh, only essentially just one line uh, if you're using this widget factory, on one line you change and you are uh, up and running on a different uh, user interface toolkit. I, you guys are all computer scientists, you, can, you, you understand what I mean. So that's the example. And what we see here is an example of the abstract factory pattern, one of the 23 patterns in Gamma's, books, uh, Gamma's book. So the general solution looks exactly the same. The abstract factory um, um, has two subclasses, concrete factory one and two, uh, that can create products uh, A and B, each in their own ver uh, version. And your client only talks to the abstract factory and the abstract products, um, and only the widget, uh, and only the factory subclasses actually talk to the concrete products. All right, so that's an example. So how did the Gang of Four book work out? First of all, it was a huge success. Um, the fact that you guys know some of the patterns by the names that the Gang of Four gave them in that book shows the impact of that book that it had in the software development community. So this is great. It's also a wonder, it, it turns out it's a wonderful book for expert communication, right? One developer can say to another developer, let's use an abstract factory pattern here, or let's use a singleton or a facade, uh, and everybody knows what's going on, at least all the developers. It's also much faster understanding a pattern by reading it in that book rather than trying to draw the essence of that pattern out of reading pure source code, even with documentation. Right? You could say abstract factory in a minute, 
uh, but it takes a long time to relate that to somebody else if you need to explain the whole concept with examples and such. So this is great, but there's also criticism uh, around the Gang of Four book. First of all, um, it's not a language. The authors didn't claim that it was a language. They said, we have 23 patterns. There are many more out there in object-oriented development. Um, we just gave you a few, and that's okay, right? It's not a complete language. Alexander actually has a fairly complete language solving um, you know, the, the, the quest of, of urban architectural design. Um, but a more tricky problem with the Gang of Four book is that it actually isn't always capturing good design solutions. Sure, uh, the singleton, the facade, some of these patterns are great and they've survived to this day. But if you read the Gang of Four book today, um, you know, there are examples I think use C++ mostly in some pseudocode. Um, you will find that a lot of them are workarounds uh, around the problems of an imperfect object-oriented language rather than really being good design principles. An even more critical issue, if you really want to call this a design patterns book, is that these uh, patterns are, don't make sense to people who are not developers. If you tell a client, I'm gonna use an abstract factory pattern, the client is gonna go, huh? And they don't know what you're talking about. Now, we could argue, is this actually a problem? Because the Gang of Four book is written for developers, by developers, it's supposed to be read by developers and shared with other developers. It creates a language among developers. This is great, right? Uh, and I think that's true. It's a wonderful book of doing that but it does not reach the higher goal of what Alexander proposed with his patterns, which was really to enable interdisciplinary communication. And that's one of the criticisms. Um, it has a lot of implementation detail, so that makes it unreadable by anybody who's not trained in reading code. But probably the most crucial difference between the Gang of Four book and what Alexander set out to do in his pattern connection is that it is not actually capturing a value system. So its language is one for only for experts. You know, the architecture patterns that Alexander wrote, you can read those even though you're not an architect. Um, with the Gang of Four book, you need to be a developer to read it. Um, and it doesn't actually capture anything about the software itself doing something good for the, for the users. It only captures how to build robust code, but it doesn't say anything about what that code is doing or whether it's doing the right thing. So it's this old problem of developer versus designer. Are you just concerned with the problem of how to solve the problem right, which is the developer? Or are you going to look at the design question, which I think has to be answered correctly before you can start the developer questions. And the design question is not how to solve the problem right, but the design question is to solve the right problem. It's a small difference in wording, but a huge one in what it means. This led to an interesting effect. Um, the Gang of Four book was actually put up uh, you know, the, the authors were put in front of a mock trial um, at a later conference, uh, I think uh, in 99 or so. I'm not seeing my presenter notes, so I'm winging this right now. Um, and uh, in, in that uh, edition, the, uh, the authors were being challenged because um, the, the, the patterns community said, you did a great job with the developer uh, patterns there, but you also kind of ruined the concept of patterns for people because they now they didn't live up to Alexander's, you know, high uh, original goals. And yeah, this was at Uppsala 1999. Now, despite this difference, something interesting happened. Uh, a whole series of conferences developed called the Pattern Languages of Programming. Um, this was a special format. It was not an academic uh, sort of submit your paper and get accepted or rejected process. Uh, instead, you wrote a pattern language. And remember that patterns capture well-known problems and well-known solutions that keep coming up. 
So it cannot be too original. In fact, if it's very, very original, it's probably not a pattern. Good patterns are things that feel strangely comfortable, like an old sweater, right? You think, oh yeah, that's actually how I've done things all the time. I just have never put a name to it. Um, so the pattern language is a programming conference collected patterns. And if you wrote a pattern in this process, you were actually submitted to a shepherding process, which helped you with an experienced writer from the uh, conference community to improve your pattern. And once they figured you're ready to go, then your pattern would be included in the proceedings. So you could present it at the conference, but it would then you know, take some time until it was actually published. Strangely enough, this pattern language is a programming conference. They had you know, the annual conference proceedings with lots and lots of patterns, but they didn't talk about HCI. They didn't talk about user interfaces. Um, there was, I think, maybe um, one or you know, one one small collection of patterns about user interfaces. And in '98, uh, there was a famous um, foreword in the conference proceedings that said, "Hmm, we've got this one language about this UI thing. Uh, is that all that there is to say about UI, or is there maybe more?" Which is funny because there's way more to say about patterns in HCI, as we will. Uh, see in just a few minutes. Now, in 1996, um, so roughly 10 years after patterns had first started out in software engineering, Christopher Alexander was invited by the Object Oriented uh, Programming Systems Languages and Applications Conference, OOPSLA, uh, to give the keynote. You know, this was 10 years after patterns had first been uh, thought of at OOPSLA um, 87. Uh, Uppsala kind of considered themselves sort of the breeding ground for patterns. You know, the PLOP conference had started, and they invited Alexander essentially to sort of you know, get the blessing from the man who, who coined the term in architecture uh, and to show him how amazing the adoption of patterns has been in software engineering. Uh, and that keynote uh, didn't go uh, the way that the um, presenters hoped, I think. The, um, you know, the invitation was you know, to, to basically comment on the efforts of the software community in creating patterns like the Gang of Four book and everything else. Uh, but his remarks were actually quite devastating. But they're also, for us as HCIers, very helpful um, to understand his key ideas. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll two short videos. Um, uh, and I want you guys to pay attention to uh, what Alexander says here about the notion of patterns. I hope this works from uh, playing this back here in this in this video capture. So one of the efforts of the pattern language was not merely to try and identify structural features which would... Uh, sorry, can you guys hear this? Yeah, for me it was uh, okay. For you guys? Yep. Yes, it's fine. Okay, good. Yeah. I'll start it again. Sorry. So one of the efforts of the pattern language was not merely to try and identify structural features which would make the environment positive or nurturing, but also to do it in a fashion which could be uh, in everybody's hands, so that the whole thing would effectively then generate itself going forward. Now my understanding of what you are doing with patterns And, and here, I mean, my comments, take them with a grain of salt, I don't, because I, I'm ignorant. I, I, I'm, I'm not in your field. But uh, the way I, when I look at the work that I've seen, I see that the format of a pattern, context, problem, solution, and so forth, it's kind of a neat format. Um, it allows you to write down let's just call them good ideas, uh, in a way that can be discussed, shared, modified, and so forth. So it's, a, it's kind of a really useful vehicle of communication. And I think that insofar as patterns have become useful tools in the uh, development design of programming languages or end of programs, um, these, these, uh, they, they, it works that way. It is kind of a neat format and that's fine. Now the pattern language that we began did have other features and I don't know whether those have translated over into your discipline. 
I mean, there was at root, behind the whole thing, a continuous moral preoccupation with under what circumstances is the environment good. And of course, in, that, in our field, that, that means something. I mean, it means something important, vital. Uh, and there are certainly plenty of people who will debate whether it's a, an objective question. I mean, some people are still going around saying it's all a matter of opinion. Uh, I think that's a dying breed, actually, the people that are going around saying that. But, but in any case, I don't know whether that sort of moral component exists in the way in which you've done things. I, I understand that the patterns, insofar as they refer to objects in programs and so on, uh, they may be, they will make a program better. That isn't quite the same thing, because then the issue, again, if I'm translating from my experience, would be, well, do they go far enough so that the, the program or the thing that is being created is morally profound, actually has the capacity to play a more significant role in human life, a deeper role in human life? will actually make human life better as a result of its injection into the system. Now, I don't pretend, by the way, that all of the patterns that we wrote down in a pattern language are like that. I mean, some of them are like that and some of them are less so. But at least it was the constant attempt. That's what we were after. I don't know whether you are after that. I haven't heard a whole lot about that. So I have no idea whether that is what you're searching for or are you only searching for a, what shall I call it, a technical performance that is good out of a program. That seems to me a very, very vital issue. Okay, so this was the first part that I wanted to play. It's just a quick clip um, that I think sheds a really interesting light on what Alexander is saying here. Um, you heard the word value in this, and this is going to become a key part of it. Why am I showing you these clips from, a, from an architect talking to software engineers? Because the point of view that he's expressing here is essentially the point of view of an HCI person. What he's talking about without knowing it is the design aspect of the user experience, the, the, the sense that the program makes to the end user rather than the behind the scenes technical workings of it. Let's look at a second clip here, uh, which is from later in this, uh, in this talk, in which he basically puts out a call to arms. He says, here's the thing that I want you guys to do because he realized that software is becoming more and more important and that, that software developers are you know, moving more and more into the center of designing people's environments and, exp uh, and, and, and experiences. This is the sec second shorter video. Please forgive me. I'm going to be very directly blunt for a horrible second. But it could be viewed that the technical way in which you look at programming at the moment is almost like guns for hire. In other words, you're the technicians, you know how to make the programs work. Tell us what to do, Daddy, and we'll do it. And what I'm proposing here is something a little bit different from that, which is a view of programming as the natural genetic infrastructure of a living world, which you are capable of creating, managing, making available and which could then have the result that a living structure in our towns, houses, workplaces, cities is an attainable thing which it has not been for the last 50 to 100 years. That is an incredible vision of the future. I realize that you probably think I'm nuts because this is not what I'm supposed to be talking about to you 
And you may say, well, gosh, great idea, but we're not interested. But I do think you are capable of that. And I don't think anybody else is going to do this job. Okay, so that was his call to arms, uh, which essentially is asking people to wonder more about the what problem are we solving and what are we designing and not how, we're, how are we going to solve that problem. You know, this crucial difference between, uh, between um, looking at it from a technical point of view and looking at it from uh, an impact point of view. What I realized, and, and I'm telling you this because this, was, this ended up being the topic of my PhD thesis in 2000. Um, I discovered the stuff from Alexander and discovered uh, software patterns and I was like, something's wrong here. Um, I was looking at it from an HCI perspective and I realized immediately when I read our, uh, Alexander's work that it was very relevant to HCI. And what had happened is that software engineering had tried to adopt the idea of patterns and some aspects of it had worked well, but somehow something was amiss. And the reason for that, I think, lies in this graph that I've laid out here. Um, architecture is concerned about the physical environments that people live in. Um, to design them in a way that people, you know, hopefully enjoy them. So they basically design the user experience of the physical world. They don't build it. They don't, they're not responsible for, you know, picking the right bricks to build a wall but they're responsible for deciding where should the you know, doors be, how, should, you know, how big should the open spaces be, how much green do we need in this uh, you know, city quarter or something like that. So UX designers for the physical, that's architecture if you want to. And that directly transports and transforms and, or, or, or maps to HCI, right? We are the, the people who are responsible for designing the user experience of the virtual, of software, of apps. And as Alexander pointed out in his last part of the speech that I cut out there, um, that becomes more and more relevant in the world as more and more interactions happen online. I mean, look at us today talking to each other, you know, in this online lecture. And in computer science, we, you know, HCI, uh, HCI folks are also not trying to solve the algorithmic problems behind it, but they're trying to put the guideposts in and continuously readjust them so that what gets developed actually is the thing that makes sense to the user. And software engineering, I mean, the word engineering is in there not by mistake, right? It, it more closely relates to structural engineering, not to architecture. Although people often talk about software architecture, and yes, we are building virtual, you know, buildings of software code, and they have an internal structure, sure. But in the end, for the system, the relevance is more related to structural engineering, making sure that it doesn't fall down. Software needs to run robustly, it cannot crash, it should be performant, all these kinds of things. It should be maintainable. All this in a real building is the realm of the structural engineer, of the, you know, um, of the engineer who makes sure that the thing gets built correctly and robustly and doesn't fall down once we understand what we need to build which is the realm of the architect. So in a way, HCI directly inherits from architecture, software engineering directly inherits from structural engineering in terms of the, the, the split between the responsibilities in, in roles um, and the technical quality that software engineering needs to worry about and should be worrying about um, is one aspect and the user interface view uh, and the, the user-centered view of the view of the user experience is the role of HCI. Now, of course, you can talk about software engineering in a broader umbrella term, and that includes the question of user experience, and that's perfectly fine. I don't care how you, uh, how you, uh, you know, which part you wrap into the, each other, but uh, the distinction in the kinds of questions that each of these people are addressing should be clear. All right, um, you find a wonderful. Uh, you know, text about this in Mitch Kapoor's design, Software Design Manifesto from 1990, where he realized this and where he said that HCI as a discipline should really be taught more like an architecture class uh, rather than a computing class. And that's why in DIS1, uh, I make you watch these histor history videos that everybody you know, you know, is wondering about. 
they're there because I want, like architects, you know, architects learn from you know, the great masters of the past. They, they see successful solutions in the past, the hits and misses. And this is the way that you learn architecture. And this is, to my mind, also how you should learn HCI to understand the design implications of these things for the people who need to use them. So Mitch Kapoor's Software Design Manifest is a short text, really worth uh, taking a look at that. Uh, it's in, uh, in um, Terry Winograd's book, um, uh, the Bringing Design to Software. Okay, we're already um, up with the time, so that's why we're gonna stop here, and next week we're gonna see how the HCI community um, adopted patterns in, uh, in their field. Um, it's very different from what software engineering did to them. Um, and today, it, uh, patterns have become a staple thing that, that you find in publications in HCI. It's turned out to actually live up much more to its potential in HCI than it ever could in software engineering. And it brings some of these ideas that Alexander had of encoding values in the design, making sure that we actually design something that is good for the people who use it. Um, it brings that to HCI. Okay, thanks everybody for listening. Sorry about uh, my <laughs> power brick dying in the middle of uh, the class. That's a uh, first for me too. Um, we'll see each other again, not next week for the class because um, while the excursion week um, has no excursions this year, uh, we don't need to use next week's uh, talk slot for, for a lecture. So you have a little more time for your own studies and for your own preparations. I'll see you again in two weeks time. Thank you for listening. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.